Hey guys, so don't mind the way that my hair looks. I actually just got out of the shower, so it's in the process of air drying, but I am studying for my phlebotomy exam that is on Tuesday. And um, this week our instructor actually gave us like a paper of what is going to be on the test um, or the exam, I should say. And so um, in class, we kind of had some time to work on it. And um, I just kind of wanted to go over like the information that's gonna be on the exam, not only to let you guys know what we are um, <clears throat> studying this week, but also um, to kind of solidify the information in my head a little bit more. So the first, um, the first question on here is list 10 things that would go onto a phlebotomy tray. So a phlebotomy tray, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the tray that they carry around that has like all of the supplies that you would need um, to perform your job duties. Um, to do, draw blood um however there's a lot more than 10 things that can be on a tray so what i put is gauze syringes um needles the sharps container like a lot of people um have a little sharps container just in case the container in the patient's room is full or for whatever reason um a tourniquet obviously um two by two gauze pads, your tubes that you're gonna need for blood collection, um, the tube holders, transfer devices, and alcohol swabs. That is the list of things that I put for what would go onto a phlebotomy tray. Um, question number two has multiple parts to it. So it is talking about needle gauges, and it says which one is the largest, which one is the smallest, which causes hemolysis, and which gauge would be used for winged infusion sets, otherwise known as butterfly needles. So, um, needle gauge is, this is what I wrote down, the diameter of the needle bore. So it's how big the needle is. Um, a 16 gauge needle is the largest, a 23 gauge needle is the smallest. Well, 23 to 25 is the smallest. Needles smaller than 23 gauge um, cause hemolysis because they're too small. Um, and butterfly needles are usually 21 or 23 gauge. And we actually took some notes um, on the gauges. So the most... Um, the largest is the 16 to the 18 gauge, and those are the ones that are used like if you donate blood. Um, that is the size needle that they will use because they are pulling a lot of blood from you. Um, the average needle size or the standard needle um, is a 21 to 22 gauge, and those are the ones that are used most common. And then the butterfly, the smallest needles that cause hemolysis, are 23 to 25 gauge. Um, and the reason why the information is a little bit different is the gauge information that I just gave you with the little ranges, um, that information came directly from our instructor. And when I said butterfly needles are usually 21 or 23 gauge, um, that came from our book. So that's why the information is a little bit different. Um, so let's see. Question number three, why would a phlebotomist utilize the syringe method during the blood draw process? So basically for the syringe method, um, you're not using like a needle, you're using a syringe to draw blood into it. So you're not using like the vacutainer system and all that stuff. Um, so why would you utilize the syringe method? You would use it if the patient has very small or fragile veins, and it also helps you to manipulate and control the speed of the blood flow coming out of the person's body because you are the one that is pulling on the syringe. Now, with the vacutainer systems, um, <clears throat> when you put the tube onto the hub, um, you actually create the vacuum and it 
it has total control of the speed of blood that is coming out of the person's body. So when that happens, you know, sometimes people who have fragile veins, you're going to blow a vein just by connecting the tube. Um, so when you use a syringe, you have total control over how fast it is. But the problem with that is you don't have the vacuum because you are creating the vacuum yourself by pulling back the syringe or the plunger on the syringe. Um, let's see. So question number four, what type of patients would the phlebotomist utilize winged infusion sets or butterfly needles on? So butterfly needles are used for venipuncture of very small or very fragile veins in children and geriatric patients, patients who are on an oncology unit, and we are supposed to use them if the patient requests it. However, a lot of places don't like you to use butterfly needles because they do cost more than the standard needles do. Um, so in order to control costs, they don't really like you to use butterfly needles if you don't have to. Um, so yeah, that's the information about that. Um, and then question number five is what is syncope? So syncope is just fainting or a sudden loss of consciousness. And that can happen if somebody um, hasn't eaten or drank enough water before they give blood or before you draw blood. Um, sometimes people are like, they freak out when they see their own blood. Sometimes people just can't handle the process. They get so stressed out. Um, so it's something that you have to look out for when you're drawing blood. Question number six, what is the only exception to the rule that all patient identification must be placed on the patient's wrist and or ankle? And I kind of talked to you guys about this a little. Sorry, my alarm went off. Um, I kind of talked to you guys about this when I was going over like an overview of what we talked about in class. The only exception to the rule about the wristbands being on the wrist um, the ID bands being on the wrist or the ankle is burn patients and that's because of the skin damage. Um, usually their their ID bands are taped um, either above their bed or on their bedside table. Um, sometimes they are connected to the bed. It just depends on how the hospital does it, but that is the only exception. Everybody else has to have a, an ID band on their wrist or their ankle before you draw their blood. Um, and if they don't, you have to go have their nurse um, or CNA um, get a wristband for them and put it on the patient. Even if they take it off, it still has to be there when you draw their blood. Um, so, question number seven, list the three major veins and their location. So I also went over this information in the overview, um, but if you didn't watch it, then I will go over it again. So the first one is the median cubital vein that is located in the antecubital area. That is the most common um, vein that we use for blood draws. It's basically in the center of your arm, um, the center of your upper arm by your elbow area where you bend. Um, that is the most common place to um, have your blood drawn. Sorry, I blanked out there. The cephalic vein is located on the thumb side of the arm, and the basilic vein is located on the inner side of the arm, and we're not supposed to use the basilic vein if we don't have to. Um, they like us to use the median cubital vein because most people, you're able to get blood there, so you really shouldn't have to worry about it. However, Sometimes you have a hard stick and you have to do what you have to do. Um, <clears throat> so then question number eight is another multiple part question. It is, what is hematoma, petechiae, and edema? So a hematoma is a bruise due to bleeding in the tissue around a vein after venipuncture. Um, and that happens if you don't put pressure on it um, when you take the needle out. Um, you need to put pressure on the area. Uh, petechiae are small, non-raised, red hemorrhagic spots. Sometimes people just get those um, after a blood draw. So you kind of have to watch out for those. 
Um, and what is edema? Edema is areas containing excess tissue fluid or swelling. The, and the swelling is due to the excess fluid in the tissue. Um, so then what is basal state? I kind of wrote down something else, but she said exactly how she wanted us to remember what basal state is. So I'm not going to give you guys my answer. I'm going to give you guys her answer. Um, basal state is the most reliable time to draw someone's blood due to a lack of exercise, lack of stress, and fasting. So that's why people like to draw your blood early in the morning is because most people at four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning haven't exercised yet. And if you have, it can affect the results of your blood draw um, because certain numbers can be off if you've exercised a lot. Um, most people early in the morning are not stressed out yet. So stress can also affect the results of your blood draw. It can affect certain things in your blood. Um, and then fasting, obviously first thing in the morning, you are fasted because you haven't ate all night. Um, <clears throat> so just a couple of things to remember. And then we have question number 10, which is the last question. What are seven areas that need to be avoided during a blood draw? So there's a lot more that I didn't list, but these are just my seven. So areas with edema, hematomas, IV sites, you're never going to want to stick um, in the same arm as an IV unless they have an IV in each arm, in which case you have to have their nurse turn their IV off for 10 to 15 minutes and then come back and draw their blood after you've waited that time. Um, however, if you do have to draw on a person who has an IV in that same arm, you have to make sure that you're drawing blood below the IV site. It can never be above the IV site. Um, so other areas to avoid, people with damaged veins, um, people who have had a mastectomy, you can't draw blood on the same side as their mastectomy, um, people with a dialysis fistula, um, and burns, scars, and tattoos. You're not supposed to draw from tattoos just because it, there's scar tissue from getting the tattoo. So uh, it's a little bit different. Like it's hard sometimes when people have like two sleeves, two full sleeves, but you're not supposed to draw um, from an area with a tattoo. So that is it for this little study session. Um, I'm gonna keep studying a little bit and I'm gonna get my book out in a little bit and um, read the chapter that we have to read before Tuesday. Today is Saturday. Um, and we're supposed to be studying order of draw in our note cards on the different departments and which tubes go to which department. So I'm going to study that after I study this for a little bit more. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed. I know this is a longer video, but I thought maybe it would be interesting if you guys could study with me for a little bit. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. Again, sorry for the longer video. All right, I will check in with you guys in a couple days with my next video. Um, I'll let you guys know how I do on this exam. So far, the first two exams that we've taken in the class, I've gotten 100% on. So I'm super excited about that. And yes, I am definitely a nerd. <laughs> um, but anyways, that's enough for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you have any questions, comments, anything like that, anything you'd like to see, um, let me know. I still do have a tourniquet, so I am going to um, be making a video about how to apply tourniquets and stuff like that um, probably in a little bit. I don't know if I'll do it today, maybe another day, but it will be coming soon on my channel, so stay tuned for that. And with that being said, I will talk to you guys again in my next video.